listener, and thank you so much for joining us on this 43rd episode of the Teaching Abroad Pod. I'm your host, Rowan Lomas, and with me this week is recently returned placement advisor and newly wrangled co-host, Janice Tremblay. Great to have you back Hello. helping people <laughs> find uh, teaching jobs abroad. How are you, mm-hmm. Janice? How are the little ones? I'm doing great. The kids are great. You might see Ethan or hear him throughout the podcast. He's kind of running around in the background down here with me right now. So. Perfect. Pets and small children are always welcome on podcasts as far <laughs> as I know. Well, he's a little one-year-old New Year's baby. So he's very energetic, very special. Famous on his first day of existence. That's right. He was in the papers, on the news. It was very exciting. <laughs> Who could ask for more? It was everything I had not wanted in giving birth <laughs> was to be on camera a few hours later. So I should also mention that we do have an interview coming up shortly with mm-hmm. Oxford Seminars grad and San Jose-based recruiting specialist Lynn Tonia Davis, who has some exciting information about new job openings around Costa Rica. But before we get to Lintonia, I know you taught in China many moons ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when you're not helping people find jobs, you're teaching locally ESL in the public school system. How's that going? That is going wonderfully. Yes, it's a new position I started this year with the, the school board here in the Ontario area. And I just love my classes. They're absolutely delightful. The students here are just wonderful kids and they're really doing well with their development so far. Awesome. So what would you say is the main difference with teaching ESL students locally as compared to Mm. teaching at an international school abroad? I would say probably the biggest difference is just the variety that you have in your ESL classroom here. When you're abroad in another country, your students are all fairly homogenous. They're all going to be, if you're in China, Chinese students mostly. And then here I have Chinese students. I have students from Honduras, students from El Salvador, students from Kenya, Somalia, Sri Lanka. They're all over the place. At one of the schools I teach at, they have, I think, 25 different first languages spoken in the building. And I'm Amazing. only one of five ESL teachers that they have there. So it's it's a lot of fun. It makes the classes more interesting and a little bit easier to get the students practicing their English talking because they don't all share a first language. So to communicate when you put them in groups, as long as they're not with somebody else that speaks their first language, they have to talk to each other in English. So they don't like I it when see I see that, that, but it's a lot of fun. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because that's true. When you're teaching in a country where everyone speaks the same first language, it's very easy Mm -hmm. to fall back into old habits and start communicating in that L1. Yeah. So what advice would you have for teachers coming back home after teaching abroad in terms of adjusting their teaching style or methodology for this new Mm -hmm. demographic? I think the only real difference you need, I guess, is just a little bit of patience, which if you've taught overseas, you've certainly developed that as well. It's, uh, I think just a, the backbone of being a teacher <laughs> is being patient with young learners, especially if you're with high school and, and younger kids, certainly. And also when you come back and you're teaching here in North America and Canada, United States, and you have a large variety of students like this, it is important to keep in mind that not only are they newcomers necessarily to the country and they're learning a new language, many of the students might be coming from difficult situations back in their home country. And so there could be trauma there. And as a teacher, you have to help mitigate that in their exposure into the high school community that they're in and make sure that you're extra careful when choosing the subject matter on the materials that you're providing them, that it isn't something that could potentially be triggering for them. This is an excellent point. I remember learning about that in my course, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of students in a immigrant or refugee, especially population, uh, may be coming from very difficult Mm war-torn countries in some cases. They may have had their own education stalled or not even started, and they may not be only English um, literacy students, but literacy students overall, they may have never learned the alphabet or their yes. you know, the, their mm-hmm. first language in a literacy context. Yeah, and that's just it. I do have some students that they have a 
broken chunks in their educational background from before they got to Canada. And uh, one in particular that any educational experience that the student has had was solely in refugee camps and they're not literate in their first language. So they only have oral language. So now they're here and they're trying to learn English as the second language, as well as just learning how to read at all and to writing out the alphabet, which they've never had to do or practice before in any context. So that's a really different situation to be in as a teacher as well. Oh, yeah, it's, it's good to it's, a reminder. It's incredible of... how far they've come and how strong some of these students are that you're going to get to work with because just all the things that they've been through already and they're still so smiley and so positive in class and so happy to be there that it's just very enriching. Absolutely. It really puts th things in perspective. It is, mm -hmm. this is all a matter of perspective. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, for sharing all of that insight. As mentioned off the top on today's show, we are going to be speaking with Oxford Seminars graduate Lintonia Davis about teaching and recruiting English instructors in Costa Rica. But first, a word from our sponsor. With Oxford Seminars, starting your new career teaching ESL couldn't be easier. Oxford Seminars has trained more than 70,000 teachers over the past 30 years, and you could be next. Our comprehensive 120-hour program starts with live instruction from an experienced ESL teacher, followed by convenient online modules. If your goal is to relocate overseas or even teach from the comfort of your own home, Oxford Seminar's renowned lifetime job placement service will get you where you want to be. Right now, you can get $50 off your Oxford Seminar's TESOL, TESOL, TEFL course price when paying in full by calling one 888 225 2480 and giving the code teaching abroad pod. Visit oxfordseminars.com today to find out more. All right, we are now joined by Oxford Seminars alum Lintonia Davis, a graduate of Agnes Scott College with a bachelor's degree in Spanish. Lintonia completed the Oxford Seminars TESOL TESOL TEFL course in Atlanta back in 2016. With the help of job placement, she began teaching at Idioma Internacional in San Jose, Costa Rica in July of 2016 and has been working there ever since. She is now a recruiting specialist. Welcome to the pod, Lintonia. Thank you so much, Rowan. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you. Uh, we're so glad to have you. It's been about a year and a half since you last joined us on the pod, Lintonia. Can you believe it's been so long? No, it's hard to believe. Uh, time has flown by, truly it has. So I had the pleasure of uh, meeting with you recently wow. for a business lunch at the Cafe Mus in Cariari, Heredia province. And I think we agreed that their pizza caprichosa with olives, artichoke, mushrooms, <laughs> all of that was quite good. Uh, I was also a big fan of the Pizzeria La Finca in Atenas, and Giorgio's here in Cariari is quite good as well. Uh, what's your experience with the pizza here? And what would you say is the best pizza joint in the country? Oh my gosh, that's a hard question to answer, but my favorite thus far that I've found, um, I live out in the outer regions um, in uh, Sarchi, and there's a place in a neighboring town called Gracia, and they have some of the best pizzas I've had the pleasure of tasting thus far, and it's actually called Mount Vesuvio, like Mount Vesuvius uh, oh. pizza, and their pizza is divine, divine, divine. So that would be my recommendation if you're ever in the Gracia area to try their pizza authentic italian style pizza i take it exactly correct <laughs> apart from pizza do you have any places you've been or major life changes that you've seen since you've joined us back in august that's a great question janice and yes i actually have two so since i joined you all in august i got a car in september and so I've had the pleasure of driving around the country, uh, life with a car in Costa Rica, which is a little bit different than perhaps navigating public transportation. Absolutely. I would agree. Um, and on the, the front of owning a car, that's one nice thing about cars being a bit overpriced here in Costa Rica is that they hold their value really well. So we bought a a nice Toyota RAV4 when we arrived here and sold it just last week because we're moving back home and we basically got the same in return that we paid for it a year ago so that's nice that is very nice and i guess i should also add an addition to your question janice um along with buying a car 
I also moved a little bit further out. So now I live in Sarchi, which is a little bit further out from San Jose. Um, but uh, to your point, Rowan, you're absolutely right. Value, uh, they do hold value well here in Costa Rica compared to perhaps stateside or even in Canada after a few years, their value going way down. Probably something to do with the fact that, um, at least I was told, half the cost of a car here is like the import duties of the cost for people to bring them here in the first place. So I guess now that you, the car is here, it has that value of already having been imported and those duties paid up front. Exactly. So last time we talked, you mentioned that Idioma has some exciting new hybrid teaching roles available, not only in San Jose, but also in beautiful Guanacaste province uh, on the Pacific coast and in Limon on the Caribbean side. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about those jobs and how they work? Absolutely. I'd be so happy to. So uh, first and foremost, as you mentioned, there are hybrid opportunities here in country. The way these jobs work, uh, we're looking at May opportunities and classes would be both on site and also virtually. So teachers would have the opportunity to get their feet wet with on site teaching and then, of course, uh, for uh, virtual opportunities as well. Uh, for the on site classes, they will be working closely with colegios or technical high school students where you're able to work uh, with these kids that are in specialties such as IT, accounting, and uh, you'll be teaching them business English. The other thing that I can let you know about these on-site classes, as you mentioned, they'll be around the San Jose Central Valley area. We also have opportunities, um, Rowan and Capos, which is maybe 10 minutes away from Manuel Antonio, so right on the beach. Um, and so we have opportunities there with some colegios there. And also in parts of, we consider it San Jose, but parts of the Cartago province where a lot of these schools and classes will be taking place. So as a teacher, you'll be traveling to and from locations. We help reimburse the travel fare, travel time, all provided for the teacher, as well as uh, you know, your payment for your classes and all the benefits that come with working with our team, such as work visa, cell phone, bank account. SIM card set up, all of that uh, that you need to be uh, set up for being in country, we can help uh, teachers with that. And we're looking at that for May. So super excited. Awesome. And so what uh, you said, a lot of these students are in their colegio. How does that translate? Is that like high school or college? Yeah, so colegio would translate to high school. And more specifically, it'd be a colegio technico. So stateside, we'd probably call that a vocational high school. And here it would be called a technical high school. So a lot of these students are actually studying what they're going to be doing after they graduate. And so English is super important for uh, their career path because they'll be going into the workforce needing it right away. So as a teacher, um, it sounds cliche, but it's true. You're literally changing lives with the English that you'll be providing for these students because it'll help them with job opportunities and internships after they graduate. Amazing. And uh, how does the lesson planning work for those? Is it provided uh, via textbook or is there a lot of creation from scratch going on? That's an excellent question. So in terms of making things uh, the easiest for our teachers and delivery for lesson plans, all of that is provided. So we have turnkey lesson plans that the teachers can use. And I'm sure for those that have already gone through uh, Oxford seminars, hallowed halls of education, you know what PPP would be. So it's based on the presentation, practice, and production methodology, as well as being very conversationally based. So students are active in the classroom. They're talking with one another um, and getting that practice in um, as they're going through the lesson plan. So um, everything is provided for the teacher for them to go into the classroom. It's the way I like it. Sounds great. That's the way I like it too. <laughs> and uh, what are the qualifications required for those positions? Excellent question. So one, TEFL certification, uh, at of seminars or another, check. Um, and also uh, a BA degree in the field of education or another uh, field. Also, um, I would say adept in technology. So being able to navigate different technical platforms. And then uh, finally, some teaching or tutoring experience would be preferred for teachers. So if you already have background with tutoring or teaching, uh, that can very much help you with being able to be uh, ready to land on your feet and go into the classroom, especially for in-country opportunities. Excellent. Thanks for that. And you still have some fully remote online teaching positions available for those who aren't living in Costa Rica, right? 
That is correct, Janice. We do have um, virtual opportunities for those outside of the country and availability for those but ongoing throughout the year. And in terms of student type, curriculum benefits, requirements, what are you looking for for those positions? So in terms of, uh, I would say the requirement for a position is actually the same as our in-country. So BA degree, TOEFL certification, adaptive technology, since you'll also be delivering classes virtually. And also um, I would say be a native English speaker. Um, I should have mentioned that for the first one as well. So we do take teachers from all over, so long as you consider yourself a native English speaker, Absolutely, uh, we wanna bring that culture um, and background into the classroom and also part of your unique teaching style and experience into the classroom for both of those areas. So great question, Janice. And what do applicants need to show you in the interview and in the application process in general, I guess, uh, in order to give themselves the best chance of being offered the position? I would say something that we look for is passion and enthusiasm, enthusiasm for teaching and education, a drive for excellence and innovation, and I would also say relatable experience. So even if you haven't had the chance to uh, get your tuple wings about you because you're a recent graduate, that's okay. But do you have experience tutoring your neighbor sister's kid in mathematics or something along those lines, whatever it may be, bring that experience to the table when you interview and when you talk about uh, your this experience. Sounds good. So enough about jobs, to be honest, a lot of people who are drawn to teaching abroad do it more for the travel than the teaching. If there's one place to see or thing to do while living in Costa Rica, what would you recommend? Oh, that's a great question. So, uh, Dennis, I would say making sure to visit uh, all of the beautiful nature or natural resources that are here. Um, one that I think in particular, a place called Volcan Arinal in San Carlos, really beautiful, verdant, mountainous area with an actual active volcano and hot springs. A lot of people go there for the thrill of seeing a volcano that's active, but also for the relaxing hot springs and uh, spa areas that uh, can be found. But there are also many other volcanoes that can be visited for hikes, such as areas in Cartago, like a Volcan Irasu, Turrialba, Guayabo, and a couple of other places. And if you're a beach person, uh, there's lots of beaches that can be visited with all types. So you can see the whales. Um, as Rowan mentioned, you can go zip lining through the rainforest. So much to do. And there's so much for anyone and everyone, uh, no matter whether you're a mountain person, beach person, or a city uh, person. So there's lots to do and lots to explore. On the note of beaches, um, I've been down to Punta Leona, the Playa Blanca, beautiful beach yes. down there. And I've been to a few other beaches uh, in Punta Arenas province. They weren't quite as impressive, I would say, in terms of the white sand and blue water and just general ambiance. But I have not been to Guanacaste. I have not been to the Caribbean. Uh, are there any beaches I haven't been to that you would say one must see in Costa Rica? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I myself am a, a favorite of mine is Punta Leona. I think we talked about this over pizza as well. Beautiful beach, uh, beautiful facilities, especially in that whole area. Um, but I would say on the Caribbean side, one that I've seen that I absolutely loved was, um, ah, what was the name? Playa Uva in Limon. So if you ever get the chance to go on the Limon side, they have one really great food and really beautiful beaches. Um, beautiful blue water, what you expect from your, you know, when you think beach, it's absolutely beautiful. And then um, another side that I would actually recommend, and I have plans to do this year, would actually be going to Manuel Antonio. Um, so I, I mentioned Manuel Antonio because as mentioned earlier, we do have opportunities in that area, wink, wink, uh, for those that might be interested for the coast. And it's all about 12 minutes away in Capo. So Manuel Antonio is a highly recommended beach. I don't know if you've had the chance to go there yet, um, Rowan, but um, beautiful views, beautiful areas, and has been recommended to me by everybody on my team. I have just not had the pleasure of going just yet. No, I've read so many great things about it. And it's obviously very popular, but we did not uh, take the time to go down there yet. So apart from pizza, are there any new or interesting foods you'd recommend people try to get a real taste of Costa Rica? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that come to my mind immediately is a uh, unique dish, and it's called patacones or tostones, as they might be called in other parts of Latin America. 
But what it is, it's a uh, sliced plantain, um, the, like the giant ripe banana. And it's sliced, it's fried, then smashed, and then fried again. Drizzle it with a little bit of, or not drizzle, but sprinkling of sea salt. And it's usually layered with uh, beans, uh, what they call pico de gallo, which is like onions, garlic, a little bit of lemon, and some type of meat. They're absolutely delicious. It sounds like a simple dish, and it is, but it's delicious. You can eat them anywhere, and they sell them at multiple locations. That's one of my favorite uh, guilty pleasures here in Costa Rica to eat. We had some uh, just yesterday, I think, from the Roast de Pollo chain of roast chicken restaurants. They were not bad. I think, I, yeah. as you said, I first introduced to those in Cuba as tostones, but same same diff, quite tasty. Although I think my favorite version of plantain is actually the platano maduro, which you get with your casados or breakfast, that mm-hmm. like a really ripe plantain, soft, sweet. I, I can never get enough of those, to be honest. Yeah. Those are delicious. And just a side note, Rowan, I would recommend if you can, that you go to, it's called La Casona de Lali's. They also sell uh, patacones, and they are some of the best I've tasted uh, thus far. So you get a chance, try the patacones out at that restaurant. You can email me that so I don't forget. I will. I will. Now, you did mention uh, earlier on that you have moved a little further out of the national capital region uh, into Alajuela province. How would you say it compares to the big city? What are the pros and cons of small town life? I would say one, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, One thing that's I think very striking about living in Costa Rica, whether that's in San Jose or in other parts is the natural beauty that's just all around. You go outside, you see mountains, you see valleys, you see fruit trees, et cetera. So I'm up in the area where they sell really great coffee by the way, um, and capitales. And so uh, I would say one of the pros of living further out is the fresh air, the open environment, the delicious fruits and vegetables that you can get from local stores and um, just the friendliness of people. Although I will say whether you're in the city or whether you're further out, you will encounter very warm, friendly Costa Ricans. Um, And perhaps maybe a con of living further out is uh, one of the benefits of living in downtown San Jose and that area is you have lots of restaurants, great nightlife, very easy access to different locations throughout the country, and um, everything is just closer together. So you have that accessibility. So I would say those are the pros and cons of living further out. My experience is a little bit different as well from what teachers might experience as the majority of our teachers are located in San Jose. So you get access to the nightlife, the clubs, the fun, the food, and all of that. For people looking for something a little more quiet, though. It's, exactly. Uh, for those looking for quiet, exactly. <laughs> Do you get um, any wildlife nearby? I was shocked if you didn't. I mean, when we were in a tennis, we had the howler monkeys you'd hear in the creek bed nearby or the toucans on the trees outside the window, things like that. Absolutely. So um, I I guess I'll claim this as wildlife, but they certainly have lots of wild chickens that run through the yard. (laughs) But yes, toucans, howler monkeys, I've seen all types of unique birds. Uh, Or pendulas, do you have those? Yes, yes. They make the funniest noises, don't they? They do. (laughs) Um, So there's quite a bit of wildlife. Probably enough, even my neighborhood is in wildlife, but they have goats. <laughs> you see it all, um, especially as you live further out from the city. Reminds me of the pigs wandering the, which is wild pigs wandering the beaches of Nicaragua. I don't know if you find that in Costa Rica, but possibly. <laughs> I've never seen pigs, but uh, when I lived a little bit closer in Ciudad Colon, I was driving down my street one day and there was a herd of, I guess, wild cows that I don't know if they escaped from somewhere, but they certainly were blocking the road. So it was a unique thing to see, but wildlife is definitely abundant and prevalent here in Costa Rica. Now you mentioned uh, you were in kind of coffee country, and I guess that's a good point for me to share with all of all of y'all some uh, souvenirs I've been collecting as I'm preparing to go back home. If you've ever been to coffee or Cafe Brit, one of the most famous uh, coffee producers here, they have this Poas from the Poas Volcano Slopes one. I think that was my favorite, which led me to also buy this one. Cafe Tres Generaciones P. 
Heberry. Apparently, they're smaller beans from the Poas area and also quite flavorful, I guess, when they have these rough climates and hard growing conditions. It's supposed to get a tastier, a tastier bean. Do you have any opinions on the best coffees to get? I would agree on that. Brit is very good, but there's also a brand that you might notice and it's called 1820. It's a very robust coffee. It's found generally almost in every supermarket, but it's very delicious. And then I can say just from living in this area, uh, there is one that I might recommend, Rowan, if you can find it. It's called Ho'opro Victoria. So uh, they actually grow it locally here in the Gracia slash Sarti area. Um, It has a nice, smooth, earthy, robust quality to it without being bitter. So um, I think the ones that you have are excellent to take home. And I would also maybe add those other two to your list, which I'm happy to email to you as well. 1820, I've definitely had. You see that one everywhere. But the the other one you mentioned, Victoria, I have not seen. So I'll keep an eye out. Another thing I got from my buddy, my buddy Mike back home, who whenever he comes down to Central America, he likes to get hot sauce. So I'm bringing him back this one, Pierre de Amas. I think it's Wow. Lost souls from Monoloco it says muy, muy, muy picante. Nice. Are you a hot sauce <laughs> connoisseur? I love hot sauce, although I haven't really gotten to the hot sauce market here in Costa Rica. But if you have one that you recommend, please let me know because I am definitely interested in trying. So, Well, my wife uh, recommended Shade Time. She read about it. Apparently, it's kind of a small producer. And we found some in Auto Auto Mercado. If you're ever looking to try Shade Time, you can find some there. Fantastic. I'll be on the lookout for it as well. Lastly, a rum I have not tried. Oh. Ron Rigo. I've never tried that, but I know that generally Ron or the rum uh, created here in Costa Rica is pretty good since there are lots of uh, sugar cane plantations in which they actually grow the sugar cane to make the rum. So. I've had different types of rums, but I'm I'm not much of a rum drinker, no. so I don't. I got pretty into the Cuban rum selection when I was living in Cuba, which is excellent. So I don't know if anything compares to that, but I'll give it a shot. I'll let you know how it goes. Please do. So I know everyone's probably really tired of talking about COVID, but unfortunately, it still seems to be relevant in 2023. So what's the current situation in Costa Rican schools? For those teaching in-person, face-to-face classes, are there any vaccine procedures or masking requirements in place? What's the situation like? Ooh, that's a great question. So um, Janice, at this point in time, there's no mask mandate. However, uh, according to the MEP or the Ministry of Public Education, vaccinations are required. Aside from that, uh, no type of masks are needed or required, and um, it's fairly easy to do on-site classes, even with the colegios, as well as other on-site uh, that we'll have with our clients, which that would not be required. <laughs> Just to clarify on that, last I had read, vaccination was no longer a requirement to enter Costa Rica as a tourist, but how is that applied or enforced in an educational context? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of getting vaccination, uh, one, we have the CAHA, which is kind of universal health care. So any type of required vaccinations could be done, one, free, and two, through the CAHA, um, especially in regards to any requirements related to teaching for on-site with, uh, I would say, minors and in the, the schools that we might have. So it's just uh, if somebody says, well, I'd like to teach there, but I'm not vaccinated, they can be offered the opportunity to become so in Costa Rica. Absolutely. And you don't have to worry about uh, navigating that before coming to the country. Good to know. All right. Well, I guess that was about it for our questions. Uh, Do you have any final advice or words of wisdom for our listeners who are thinking about teaching in Costa Rica overseas or in general, even online? Yeah, my final word of advice would be to do it. Um, I think TEFL and the TEFL certification really literally opens doors to you. Uh, You will meet some of the best students that are motivated, want to learn, and want to learn from you as their teacher. And it's a great opportunity to meet people, to learn and grow yourself. And if you're wondering if you should, of course, the first steps always seem a little bit scary, but once you do it, it's, it's an incredible opportunity. You won't regret it. I myself as a graduate have absolutely loved 
uh, being able to do this and being able to experience teaching outside, living outside in the world outside of where I come from and meeting so many wonderful people um, that want to learn and want to grow with the skills that you have as a native English speaker with TEFL certification. Great, great wisdom as always. You're a shining example, a beacon of what uh, you can do as an Oxford Seminars graduate and all the places you can go and career progression that may be available. You helped me find it, so thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It was so great as always having you and hopefully we'll have you back someday. I would love to. And thank you both for uh, having me on. It was a pleasure to speak with you all and always fun chatting with you guys. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It was great having you. Before we go, Rowan, could you tell us a little bit more about Oxford Seminars Job Placement Service and how it can help our graduates in finding teaching jobs in Central America? Absolutely. So uh, we have contacts with a number of opportunities in Costa Rica and Honduras, but there is one program we work with in Guatemala that has made some changes recently that I really wanted to highlight today. So the nonprofit that we work with has secured enough funding that they are now able to offer free homestay housing for their teachers, as well as a $100 US per month stipend to help cover any extra costs for food and fun and whatever people want to get up to while they're down there. So working alongside local Guatemalan teachers in Colonial Antigua, participants can serve underprivileged and motivated children ages 4 to 18 in Ciudad Vieja, and San Lorenzo El Cubo. Some other things worth mentioning about these positions, in addition to the housing and stipend, is that English teachers will have a lot of flexibility when designing their lessons, but will also have curriculum support from the permanent staff. It's a great option for those seeking a short-term job. Uh, there are four-month positions available starting in July, or just 40-day summer, quote-unquote, summer positions starting in October, which is when the Guatemalan summer in public school starts. Having a bachelor's degree is not required, so it's a good one to consider for high school grads. If you'd be interested in teaching in Guatemala, definitely let your placement advisor know. Thanks for the update, Rowan, and thanks, as always, for tuning in to the Teaching Abroad pod. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the like and subscribe button and also share it with your friends. Remember, we can be found on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. If you have any great ideas you'd like to hear us discuss in the upcoming episodes, please leave them in the comments on YouTube or send them in the comments to Oxford Seminars on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And finally, you can email us at the teachingabroadpod at oxfordseminars.com. Thanks for listening.